three. Hello and welcome back to the Mixing Music Podcast. I'm your host, DK, and today with me, as always, we have Lou. What do we have for this week? Satisfying, nope. Scary, nope. Uh, I'm Um, done with the S's. Ghoulish Lewish? Ghoulish Lewish. I'm down, I'm down. We're going to keep that. Ghoulish Lou. Yeah, Ghoulish Lou. And today we have an awesome topic and an awesome way into segueing into this episode. We're going to talk about our marketing plan and specifically one part of the marketing plan, which is, in my opinion, the most important part of the marketing plan. And this is very general. It's very theoretical. I think we both agree upon this and how you apply it is very diverse and and it can go in so many different directions. But the idea is the ultimate marketing plan for recording studios, for producers is happy customers. Oh, yeah. Now, I think that's for any sort of business. And I think that anybody can say that in any industry, but it's especially important for us because as a producer, as an industry professional, you will find that people will pick who they trust and they stay with who they like, who they know. And it's all based around trust and it's all based around word of mouth. Word of mouth is absolutely important as it is, again, in every other industry, but even with all of our ad, ads that we're running and everything that we're doing, the best source of income of clientele is actually still through word of mouth. Yeah. No, it's actually very true. Uh, one of the things I tell everybody all the time is, you know, when you're in the studio, when you're in sessions, you got to learn how to keep the vibe going, understand who's obstructing in those kind of senses. But the biggest reason that we have to look out for these things is because we want to make sure that our client is happy. We want to make sure that they feel comfortable, that they feel that they're in a space that's very private, that they don't have to worry about music being leaked or people knocking on their doors and things like that. So whatever we can do to make our clients happy ends up creating return business. And return business in our industry tends to be mainly because they like having consistency. They want to know that they can show up to the same place with the same team and have the same people working with them at a certain level of efficiency that they're used to. But as soon as they start getting little wrenches in the works, they, they're quick to move to a new place. Yeah. So keeping them happy is the biggest thing we can do. Yeah, and I, I don't want to dive more into this topic because keeping customers happy is a combination of a lot of things. And the first thing that I actually want to go over is systems in the sense that do you have rules? How do you present them? What are your studio policies How do you present them? How do you book clients and how do they pay? So anything that is a system, that is a workflow of getting clients and bringing them in, getting their money and them leaving happy, right? So that's the first thing. And I would say that I like systems a lot and I spend a lot of time building out systems and workflows for different things. How much would you say, Lou, that systems is like important? Well, it's actually very important. Realistically, We want to make sure that everybody's comfortable from the moment they walk in. But part of that is making sure that every time they come back, we've kind of catered more towards them, right? So part of what we put into place is asking our engineers and asking people that work with our clients is, what did you notice? What did they like? What did they not like? You know, and so we can start adding this to a certain routine, not just for our own studio culture, but we can actually start putting this into action for every time that client comes back. For instance, we know our client Flays, who was here yesterday. You know, he's from out of town, so he's looking to work in a room, bring his friends over and be able to not just collaborate with the local side of things, but he wants to make sure that it's uh, 420 friendly. So we know every time when we book him, we can ask him like, hey, would you like that again? Every time he comes in, he likes everything clean, but he likes a microphone in the booth and in the live and in the control room so that he can record himself. And then when the other artists come in and they say, I want to be in the booth, he has a mic ready in the booth. He knows which ones he likes in which order. And whenever he books us, we don't actually have to ask him anymore. We just know and we have it ready for him. Yeah, it's kind of that convenience factor. But it's also like a factor of what I think what you're saying as well to add on that is it's a factor of professionality. Like people want to pay money to a professional system, to a professional studio, to a professional producer. And if you're sitting there going like, I don't know what to do, what's the next step? But you're charging a butt ton of money, like maybe that's not a good system, right? Exactly. Maybe maybe there's something that you can do. Like even as simple, something as simple as going to my website and asking me for a quote. Like mm-hmm. that could get very complicated yeah. or could be very simplified. And 
that's a system that may or may not add to your happy customers. And this is where it gets difficult because not everything you do is going to make clients happier. It's going to be, the reason why I think that we do so well with this is because we spent years trying different things and yep. seeing what works, Yeah. right? Throw it to was, the wall, was there something, sticks. I don't know if there's anything that you can think of on the spot. I'm putting you on the spot here, but has there ever been a system that you've implemented in the past that didn't work? Yeah. Uh, asking too many questions and explaining too much. Sometimes people just want things a little more simplified. And so uh, when you talk about how we move in modern days and how businesses need to adapt to modern trends, right? Mm -hmm. Notice how simple everything's gotten. Everybody's just quick to click and go. Creating a way to book a studio in that sense and having communication between the owners, between management, between engineers be very quick and easy is a key thing. But when I actually tried to make things a little more organized for myself versus my clients, that system fell apart because nobody wanted to use it. It was too complicated. There was too many questions being asked ahead of booking to where it's like halfway through filling it out. They're like, you know what? This is just too much. I know I can call the studio down the street. Just one phone call, say, I need studio time. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that's a great example. Another thing that I want to top into. So the first thing was systems. And the number two thing, this is Lou, you're the king of this. <laughs> Ghoulish Lou, you're the king of this, is amenities. And oh, kind yeah. of customer service. I want to go into customer service next, mm -hmm. but specifically with amenities. What is that? What does that mean? Amenities to me make, means uh, making sure that everybody's comfortable, surprising them with the factors that they didn't expect to be greeted with. You know, like, yes, they want a 420 se friendly session, but I'll leave ashtrays everywhere for everybody to use. Not just one for the room, because let's be honest, most time people are smoking, they're smoking in groups. I know for a fact that I've, you know, I've participated in them and, you know, I'm across one side of the room. They're on the other side of the room. One ashtray doesn't make sense. So having that little bit, having the ambience of the room be alterable to each client. Some people like blue lights. Some people like purple lights. Some people like green lights. So having color changing lights is a big thing. Having a PS4 in the lobby. Exactly. With the games from Bioshock to Call of Duty to things I've never heard of before. To, to having Mountain Dew and Pepsi always stocked up. Oh, yeah. Having a Korg mini log just ready to play. Yeah. And... Uh, TVs for watching. Oh, yeah. And w at one point, we had like a bottle of Hennessy for our label clients. Oh, yeah. I bought that at Costco. I just saw it. I'm like, you know what? My clients would love this. Bought the giant bottle of Hennessy, and I don't think I charged anybody to drink from it. Which we, sh we should have, but. <laughs> should have, but. <laughs> but hey. I mean, but that's a great form of amenity, right? Exactly. Like it's more like, hey, can we send somebody out to the store for a bottle of Hennessy? It's like, you know what? I have one here. You can have it. Yeah. And the idea is going along with customer service and diving deeper into it is keeping your clients happy by giving them what they want. And I think in the sense that like, you're not supposed to give them everything that they want, but the better you understand your clients and the better you can actually understand what it is they enjoy during their sessions or while they're working, the better you can actually cater the session to them. If some person uh, that books your studio goes and always has uh, let's say, snacks of, let's say, uh, cashews and a Gatorade. Well, maybe carry some cashews and Gatorade and have them for yourself. And whenever that person's there, if they don't have any and they're about to send somebody out or try to order some, be like, hey, I actually have some here because I know you like to book with us and we wanted to make sure these things are available for you. We've talked about having our own pre-rolls and stuff like that here at the studio with our own logos and everything. Cause actually, we're we, in the middle of working on our own uh, brand of... Yeah. Of uh, some weed. <laughs> some good stuff. But uh, that's kind of the funny thing. The, the whole idea behind it wasn't because we were just instantly like, hey, we should have weed available. No, it's because we have so many clients that are sending people out for runs to the dispensary. Sometimes it's two in the morning and none of them are open. Yeah. You know, and so we want to be able to cater to everybody's needs, but nobody's asking for these things. But the fact that we're going above and beyond to be able to cater to our clients is what that satisfaction really builds from. And and let me put this into like perspective as far as what's how why it's important to spend money on this stuff. Most of the amenities that you pay for any sort of thing, they're usually not things that you make money back from. For example, if you have potato chips lying around, you're probably not going to charge them for a simple bag of potato chips or whatever, and it's not really feasible. But or or excuse me, or the time that you spend on the PS4 is not really a chargeable time. But it's adding to the vibe. And I think that a lot of people, going back to our 
usual conversation of gear. I really do believe that in instead of paying for advertising for if you're a local studio or if, if your business is scalable and it doesn't matter where you're from or whatever, but if you're a local studio or a local producer where vicinity is a big part of your business model and where you're at, then I would say that it's better to spend money on amenities and going the extra mile than it is to spend on Google ads, Instagram ads, or more, way more important than gear. Now, gear could go into amenities as well. Like, for example, at our higher end commercial recording studio, the CL1B that by TubeTech, that is a much requested compressor and it's an amenity, right? But at the same time, like small th- stuff like the PS4, because at the same time, we're also competing against yeah. like these bigger studios where they're one studio used to give out cookies all the time and Oh man, I had cookies the other day at one of those studios. Mm. Yeah, so so like these small things that seem cheap and small actually or tedious. Yeah, or tedious are actually very big parts of keeping your clients happy, helping them feel welcomed, helping them feel like they're part of something and helping them feel satisfied when they come in and feel comfortable. That's the most important part is comfortability. Because when an artist comes in and they're not feeling themselves and they're not feeling comfortable, they're not going to be in the right mindset to record stuff. So it's all of that combined is what makes amenities. And Lou is the king of making sure that <laughs> amenities are always stocked, that we're going ahead, that we're thinking about them. Because in terms, or in their terms, we're thinking about them, right? Yeah, exactly. The, the biggest factor that I tell everybody, if you want longevity with your clientele, you have to show that you at least somewhat care. If you don't care, they don't care. But the moment you start reaching out and saying, hey, I know your favorite color is purple, so we actually set up purple lights in the booth. We actually set uh, an off uh, color on the trim of uh, pink because I know that's your other favorite color. Great. You just showed them that one. You paid attention to what they've actually mentioned before. They know that you're actually creating a vibe for them to walk into before they have to create it themselves. If you know that they like candles, start buying candles and have them available. Have them lit when they arrive. If they don't like candles, get all the candles out of the room. If uh, they like to record in the corner of a room, have the microphone already available in that corner. You know, these little details is what keeps them around. But... They'll never really ask for them in advance unless they have that expectation there. And even if they had that expectation there, the fact that they called and you said, I've actually already done that for you, they're going to come back. Yeah. Which goes into, segues into our next session, which I think is going to be our last section here, is the idea of customer service. And I want to go even broader and say, not just customer service, but customer interaction. Yell at them all the time. (laughs) Yell. Scream. (laughs) I would say that this is actually super important, and this is the make or break of a great engineer and a mediocre one. Um, It's not about the sound, but it's about the customer interaction in the sense that, like you said, when is it time to talk? When is it time to shut up? Also, uh, just being emotionally intelligent. If If I were to go back and had to build my own curriculum for engineering school, I would have a major section of the required classes be like psychology and mm-hmm. how and emotional intelligence like how to understand your clients what they're saying but what they actually mean when is it appropriate to defend yourself and take when someone gives you feedback and be like nah you're wrong or like when it's appropriate to say give up you know like things like yeah. that like reading the room is very very important and i wanted to even say that one of the things that i'm really blessed with and this is a blessing or a curse but i see it as a blessing is i always joke and say i'd be I'm a really great engineer, but I would be horrible A and R because every single client that comes in, it's it's got to be pretty bad for me not to vibe with it. Like <laughs> I I very yeah. easily vibe with stuff and find the good in anything. Like yeah. you give me a pretty shitty song, I will still be like, yo, this shit slaps, and I will get really invested. And when the client comes in, I'm not just their engineer; they feel that I am genuinely invested in their project, in their song, like. And I'm not saying that I work with a lot of bad artists, but what I am saying is for me and my personality, that works to my favor. I, I always brag about how I may not have the best mixes. In fact, I, I'm in the top, I'm, you know, I, I'm not going to say I'm bad. I'm pretty good, but I'm very extremely confident in my customer satisfaction rate because of the communication, the yep. trust. And then they know every single client that comes in, like I'm invested. It's in both of our best interests to make this sound as best as we can. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. 
no, honestly, I don't think I could have said anything better than that. Yeah, and, and yeah. I I do think that this is a big part of the customer satisfaction that people are missing. Yeah. And maybe you're not the type of person, whoever's listening right now, and maybe you're not the type of person that can casually say, I like everything that I listen to, right? You're not always going to like it. That's normal to not. I promise you, you're not always going to like it. But <laughs> that's another thing, I guess, being honest with your clients. Because you, you touch base on it, knowing when to shut up, knowing when to speak up, knowing when to let it slide, knowing when you should actually give some suggestions. Unfortunately, I've had situations where I give clients a refund because I just can't work on the song because it is that bad. You know, it's going to happen. Whether you're trying to come up as an engineer or you're an artist and you get rejection, rejection exists. But understanding how to communicate that rejection, whether it's like, hey, I asked for a Pepsi. You guys brought me a Coke. What the hell? (laughs) Like those little details do matter. But sometimes when you're in a session, let's say the artist is a little off key and you don't know how to communicate that. Yeah, maybe you should take a class on psychology and communication because the reality is you're dealing with creatives and you may be the artist dealing with an engineer, which some engineers think more logically than creatively, you know what I mean? And there's that communication barrier. But that's where the satisfaction comes in when you are able to communicate properly. And I think that's the biggest thing, communication. If we learn how to communicate properly, we can find out what amenities they like and things like that. We know what to have uh, uh, ahead of schedule, what to do during the session, how to communicate our views. But you got to build that foundation of communication. Yeah. Without it, you can't have a happy customer, no matter what anybody tells you. You could work remotely, and they could be satisfied with the work, but that's it. They were satisfied with the product you presented them, not with the relationship you've built. But a happy customer has relationship with you. And this is one of those weird things where, actually, this is something that happened this week. Again, about two years ago, someone anonymously, under a fake name, posted a one-star review of my studio on Google Maps. And this was pretty eye-opening. It was my first bad review. And it started with, DK is very talented and good at what he does, but... I could tell that something along the lines of, I could tell he wasn't invested in my project and he wasn't feeling it or he was in a bad mood or something like that. And it sounded like it was one session with someone that I don't really know very well, but it was to a point where it wasn't my, the end results, because the reason why I know it's not my end results is because this person apparently was petty enough and hurt enough, uh, you know, my mistake, hurt enough that he did it again two months after the first initial time, which was about two years ago. Mm -hmm. And then he did it a third time about, a couple weeks ago, a year and a half after the the second time that he did it, which it matters way less now because I'm not even operating that studio anymore. But to the point, where, like I got someone to get really petty and malicious over not having it's it's. I actually had a great product, and that was the consistent message across all three bad reviews. Mm. Is DK's good at what he does? He's very talented. I can't deny that. Yeah, but he wasn't interested in what I was doing. Like, think about that. Your end result doesn't matter, right? Mm-hmm. In order it's to the- Customer satisfaction. It's the customer service, the customer interaction, customer satisfaction. And I've I, shown songs to people where like they'll ask me, oh, show me what you've been mixing recently. And it's like, oh, actually, I don't like the last song I mixed. Why? Well, the client kept making requests that just didn't fit the vibe. I communicated them, and they still bounced back against it. And, well, I gave them what they asked for, but it's not exactly to my liking. But in the end, it doesn't matter how much I like it. I want my customer to like it. In fact, I want them to love it. Yeah, Because if they don't love what we're doing together, if they don't feel like I'm a team player, then things like that happen where they're like, oh, well, they're not really invested. They just got it done, this and that. And, you know, unfortunately, some people take it harder than others. So if something doesn't seem like a big deal to you, you might want to rethink that thought. Because it, I tell people all the time, the architect's first sin is building a house for himself. <laughs> I love that quote. Yeah. It literally stop getting hired to do something. And then doing what you want to do versus listening to what your client wants you to do. Now, you can flourish and do more than what they ask for. Go above and beyond. I tell everybody, go above and beyond. But if you can't give them what they asked you for, then you've been hired for the wrong job. Yeah. And before we finish up, I do have one more point that I want to you know, wrap everything up in. But before I get to that point, I want to bring up the fact that Lou and I are both, uh, Lou especially is pushing out his stuff on sound better. If you'd like to hire Lou for mixing or mastering, I know you got a lot of mastering projects coming in. Oh yeah. You could find Lou on sound better and I'll put the, his sound better link in the description of our episode. If you'd like to 
you know, ask me how much I charge for my mixes and whatnot, you can go to my website, which is also in the description in the episode, links.dkmixes.com, links.deekeimixes.com, and you can request a quote from me from my website. I'm probably a little bit more affordable than y'all think, and I'm always taking clients, and I'm always backed up and behind, but I, I love uh, getting requests. And if you're located locally, I know we have a lot of clients that actually fly out from the other coast, from the East oh, Coast, yeah. to come to our studio. But if you'd like to book some time for the recording studio, you just hit us up on the DMs at inthemix.studios, right? Yeah. On Instagram. And you can book some time with us or call us um, at our business number, which I don't know off the top of our head. <laughs> but feel free to book some time with us if you'd ever like to do that. And kind of at least uh, for the experience of what it's like to be go to a professional recording studio so you can copy yeah. it and emulate it in yourself. In fact, I think we should uh, attach a link to the walkthrough. Uh, we had a vlogger, a friend of yours, come through, uh, and he actually took video of walking through the studio. Yeah, I'll, we kind of gave a, him a little I'll, nice little time here, you know, showed him what we got, what we're doing. And what we've done, you know. And I'll add that link to that YouTube video uh, in the description as well. But the last thing that I want to bring up to wrap everything up is communication. Communication is, this is where I pride myself personally. It's not, it's there's verbal communication and then there's physical communication. There's emotion. There's a lot of different types of communicating stuff, but along with the customer interaction is the communication, especially as an engineer, mix engineer, a recording engineer, I hate to say it, is more of, yes, you're good, but especially at lower to mid levels, it's about whoever's just there, who can do it, right? Uh, who can you, who you vibe with? But for mix engineers it's and mastering engineers, it's a lot of whose sound do you like? Like you go for them, like it's, it's like a barber. You don't just go to another barber. Yeah. There's other better barbers out there, but you might be willing to spend more on the barber that you already have for comfortability's sake than to go on to another barber. On top of that, you don't always have to have one engineer. Some engineers specialize... Or just have a significantly better sound on one side, and you might want to switch it up, but you got to communicate it. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's where communication comes place. And I always say this, that my mixes are good, but I pride myself most on my communication and my customer satisfaction rate. Because you'll see me, there's a lot of small things that I do that I incorporate that I've talked about in previous episodes, if you've been listening for a while, long time. For example, things like being very confident, never saying, I don't like this mix that I did myself. Never saying that, uh, like trying to be scarcity mentality. For example, for me personally, I never say, hey, you only get two revisions. I always say you get unlimited revisions because I know you're going to get it right the first time. Like nobody ever asks for more than one or two. And like when I say it like that, it's like it's because I'm putting my money where my mouth is. And it's all about confidence, especially when you're coming into my new barber shop. You're going to see if I, you like it or not. Yeah, you have a hairstyle that you like. But you got to be open to the idea that I might be better before we even start. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, or else I'm doomed. If you go in, and even if I give you the best damn haircut you've ever got, but I kept asking questions and wasn't communicating confidently, you'd still be like, ah, shit. Like, did he fuck something up and not tell me? Yeah. Like, you can't see the second half, like, behind your head, really. Like They drew a butt on the back of your neck. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you don't really know. So it's that act of confidence and communication before not cocky this is yeah. important not cocky but a way that to show them i'm on your team to be honest there's been a lot of cocky engineers i've met that i'm just like yeah as as much as i like you i wouldn't hire you and that's coming from another engineer you know it's like hey man i love your confidence but i can't work around people who just talk like that and i know a lot of my clients couldn't so Sorry. Like, yeah. Your form of communication is just too much at that point. Cockiness is definitely something to definitely avoid. There's a difference between confidence, putting money where my mouth is, and pride. Yep. Like you can confidently say, hey, if you don't like it, you don't have to pay me. And then there's like, you know what? I guarantee you're going to like it. I've worked with so-and-so and blah, blah, blah. So there's no way you're not going to like it. It's like, Mm, I don't know. Just because you worked with them doesn't mean you've worked with me. Like, you, you haven't even heard my music. Like, you're walking into this blindly saying that. But somebody just saying, hey, I'm confident that you're going to like it. You don't have to pay me if you don't like it. It's like, oh, shit. They're going to, sounds like they're going to put some time into it. Like, yeah. Th I'm, I'm very curious to hear what they're going to give me back. Like, I know they haven't heard it, but they're, they're willing to do it for free if, they, if I don't like it. Yeah. And I think this this goes into the idea that 
with Soundbetter, I didn't do very well with Soundbetter. Mm -hmm. Soundbetter just did, wasn't my thing. And my clients, I had a very low, relatively speaking, I had a low customer satisfaction rate. People are always asking for revisions and whatever. And, and it came down to the fact that the people hiring me that on, on Soundbetter didn't know me. They only knew my credits. Mm -hmm. So these, let's say, for example, these insecure people that wanted a better mix, they come mm -hmm. to me, they find that I have good credits mm -hmm. for my specific names, and then they're expecting me to make the same sounding record that they got on those. And I'm like, yo, like you need to edit your vocals. You need to do a lot more than just mix. Like, and so because of that, there's the lack of communication Mm -hmm. I feel like I had a low customer status. That's why I stopped doing Sound Better in general. But yeah. I know you're doing well with it. I'm a premium provider now. Yeah, there yeah. you go. And But at the same time, with Cold House, which was my previous studio, mm -hmm. someone want to book a time, they go to the website. Let's say they find it on Google, or mm -hmm. they find it on Apple. However they find it, they go to my website. On the website, I have a little intro video of any engineer that they can hire. So right now, I, because I don't have any engineers at that studio, it's just me. It's just me and the, my co-owner co-founder of this mm. studio and we have videos introducing ourselves what kind of music we like and just hearing our voice and how we talk and then you can book time with me mm -hmm. you know you can not only did you get introduced to me you could book time with me you can go straight from there's no email back and forth you can pay for a session and book it right there right and yeah. and that was this beautiful amount of uh, they feel like they know me because they watched the video it was super simple there was no extra communication needed that was a system thing, but that was also led to huge levels of increases of customer satisfaction for just doing an intro video because they felt like they knew me. Yeah. Again, meeting the barber before you get a haircut. Mm -hmm. Imagine taking your barber out to lunch and finding out how cool he is, you know, or vice versa. He finds out how cool you are as, an, as a client. Maybe I can get some nicer cuts. Yeah. <laughs> and like, maybe I give a discount because yeah. I like your music. Actually, I do that all the time. Anytime somebody asks me like what my rate is and they say, you know what, I think I'm going to have to wait or, or sometimes what I like to do is if I don't hear anything back for like a week, it's like, okay, maybe I scared them away. But I always ask them, can you send me the song? Because if I like the song, honestly, I'm willing to go down on my price. If you're willing to clean it up and things like that, and that's where other satisfaction parts come into it. Like if, if you just take on a mix and you just mix it as is because that's what they hired you for, then sometimes they leave breaths and things like that, and they're going to ask you to take it out anyway. So sometimes doing those extra little things, if it takes an extra 20 minutes of, t of your time, just clean it up, just do it. But sometimes, like you were saying, the, the satisfaction factor with uh, Sound Better, the reason that I've had success with it is because I let them know in advance, like, hey, I really like this song. I'm willing to go down on my price on it just to work on this, but... In exchange, I did notice that there's a lot of breaths. There's a lot of this and that in there. If you clean that up, I will agree to this price. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually think emotionally, that's a great way to communicate it. Like, yo, I love this song. I'm going to give you a discount. And then mm -hmm. if I was the client, I'd be like, oh, shit. Lou likes my song? Yeah. Oh, I don't even care about the discount. Like, that's going to make me happy. Like, yeah, that means you're going to get involved. invested in it. So, to be, I hate to do this. I hate to say this because don't fake it. I think faking it is the worst thing you can do. But if you're an excitable person that you can find a reason to get into something, I would say show it Yeah. as much as you can to your client. Yeah, I'm an Just introvert, like, but when I like something, they see me like grin and it's creepy, but they know I like it. Yeah, and that sort of physical communication in the studio, if the client's in the studio, then like, making sure that you're paying attention, that you look like you enjoy it. And hopefully most of the time you don't have to pretend like you look like you're enjoying it because you're enjoying it. That just looks even creepier. Yeah. But anyway, I think that's kind of wraps it up for this episode. If yeah. you <laughs> Customer satisfaction. It's, it's the best marketing point. It's the communication. We may not do so well in one medium versus another, but as long as your overall goal is let me hear what they need and you attempt to go above and beyond that with, let's say, amenities or the extra little bits of work, Trust me, you'll have return business. You'll have great word of mouth because even though word of mouth is technically the best form of marketing, it could also be the worst because guess what? Bad news travels 10 times faster than good news. So for every time you do something wrong, you got to do something right 10 times just to make up for it. That's important. That's super important. But yeah, we'll you leave can't you. Afford, you can't afford to have one unsatisfied client. Yeah, but we'll leave you guys on that. Keep it in mind. Remember, don't build a house for yourself. <laughs> That's right. On that, happy mixing, my friends, and stay saucy. One, two, three.
If you'd like to take advantage of my free guides and online videos, please check out links.dkmixes.com. That's links.dekeimixes.com.